If your son were here, I feel sure he would tell you not to grieve him, for he would not be the boy that you sent away. That boy is dead. You may think I have little worth. You may think I betrayed you. But I need you to know that if you will not have your mother's love and take your father's strength, you need it. What is this feeling so sudden and new? I felt the moment I laid eyes on you. My pulse is rushing. My head is reeling. Yeah, well, my face is flushing. What is this feeling the fervent eyes of flame? Does it have a name? Yes. Loathing. Unadulterated loathing. For your face. Your voice. Your clothing. Okay, as we get kicked off here on November at the movies, I want to, two things first. I want to first apologize for my voice, which might be really annoying now. This is what happens when you run a pro wrestling karaoke night, and pro wrestling fans aren't generally the most amazing singers, so you have to do backing vocals on the fly for everyone <laughs> to try and make sense of the songs. And this is this voice is the end result. So I apologize for my voice up top. Um, I want to start with a bit of a story and preamble as we kind of kick off this month. Tom, you like I are a big Kermode and Mayo fan. Uh, yeah. Obviously, Kermode is probably the reason I got into movie reviewing. And one thing they have for anyone who doesn't listen to them is a code of conduct for the cinema that is kind of one of their big calling cards. Uh, symbols of like, don't talk, don't eat like hot or smelly or loud food and stuff like that as well. And I really admire it because I am a believer in cinema etiquette, but I'm also not a full convert of it. I basically myself have like, I, I, the reason I'm not a full convert is because people are kind of unique and they have unique needs and stuff like that. And they enjoy movies in different ways. And some of the best cinema moments in history for me happened spontaneously and broke the code. Like, if you think of Spider-Man, No Way Home, the cinema screaming when, like, the cameo started. Or Avengers Endgame. Like, I remember I watched Pulp Fiction in the cinema a few years ago. And just the reactions, people quoting, laughing and stuff. Like, and that wasn't code compliant. But at the same time, it made for a really fun experience. I've got one rule when it comes to the cinema. It's don't bother anyone else trying to enjoy the movie. If they're trying to enjoy it, your actions should not impinge on that. That's my only rule, however that takes shape. And yeah, that likely means don't chat because you're not on Gogglebox and nobody there gives a shit about your banter. But don't spend the entire thing just bothering people with the light of your phone and stuff like that as well. Like that, that stuff matters. But like, I'm not going to be too strict on that. Having said all of that, November at the movies saw me encounter the worst behaved audience I had been around in a long time. So, Tom, as we get kicked off, it made me think, what's your worst behaved audience in recent memory? What was the movie and what did they do? So talk, talk me through kind of uh, talk me through that. It's tough. I feel like a lot of my poor audience interaction I've really I've revisited here and talked about in the past. Like, I mean. I, only last month I told you that I, I was at a screening of Venom where the fire alarm went off multiple times. <laughs> but Which, to be fair, to isn't me. the audience's fault? It's not the audience, it, Unless suppose. they set it's the not. fire. <laughs> That's true. I, I, I did something did come to me that it also happened while I was in America, and I can't remember if I told you this. So um, it was, you know, it was around the Halloween season. Uh, Americans love bringing back, you know, Halloween favorites. Um, and this was a really exciting screening I was going to. It was... In a theater, it was like a proper fucking screening. I was like, man, this is going to be awesome. I can't wait to sit down and watch this movie, man. And I get there, and people are blowing bubbles. They're they're blowing noisemakers. They're flashing lights. Um, there's people standing up and, like, just shouting at the screen. <laughs> and, like, not just, like, shouting normal stuff. Shouting, like, vulgar-ass shit. Like, I, I mean, I'm like downright anatomical like words i haven't heard since like 
secondary school biology class like you know okay. um there's since it's a theater there's people on the stage copying the film in front of it in real time while it's going on i'm like <laughs> what the fuck is going on here there's people dressed now i'm no prude right but there's people dressed as sexy maids there's lads just in fishnets there's people just down to their their skivvies like you know i, I haven't seen that much dangling meat since i walked past a butcher office like you know it's just it's it's madness um and like all this is going on and i'm just sitting down and be like i'm trying to watch the movie <laughs> um it was a lot and i think that's why <laughs> you know i don't think i'm going to go back and see the Rocky Horror Picture Show again. <laughs> yeah, it was well, chaos. Sorry. It was fun chaos, but man, it was it was pretty chaotic. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a great example of something that actually, yeah, like that is breaking all the rules, but actually it adds to the experience. And the movie I want to talk about, it may be a bit controversial because I want to talk about Wicked. That was the movie I experienced, okay? And there's a big discourse currently around Wicked where it's like is it okay to sing during Wicked if you know the songs is it okay to dance or kind of have the Rocky Horror Picture Show because a lot of people have a lot invested in that I'm not one of those people but there was a lot of kids singing and dancing a few kids every time Ariana Grande came on the screen they waved and they were right in front of me so I'm like what's going to off fucking they're waving again <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it's not about that I don't hate that actually to me I don't mind if that's my experience because the reason we go to the cinema is so we have an experience and see it with other people and see it through their eyes and maybe appreciate something else as well, okay? What I do want to call out is one group in particular that went and it was not a young couple, but like, you know, in their like late 30s or whatever and they brought about 15 young boys to see Wicked, okay? <laughs> and I'm not like... This is a boys movie. This is a girls movie. I went as a 37 year old man by myself to see Wicked and, and, and I loved it. Okay. And spoiler for later. But anyway, but these were, I don't think if it was a birthday party. I don't think the birthday boy asked for this. I think he might have said, we'll go to a cinema or something because these were boys. These were like, these had no interest in what was going on on the screen. And like, I'd say the couple just were like, we'll, we'll take them to the cinema or some shit. And this was the only kids movie that was on that day. And it worked out. And the couple made zero effort to control their group. They ran around the cinema. They were up and down the stairs constantly. They were climbing over seats. It was wild. And I have lived the life. I'm, I've am i lived that experience of taking kids to the cinema and it being hectic. So I'm not trying to shame these people but at the same time while i struggle or while i sympathize with parents who do struggle with it these parents did not struggle they didn't struggle at all because they didn't have an ounce of fucking shame if you're in that position where you have kids and they're not behaving well okay the minimum I expect is someone being a little bit embarrassed or some, like being like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Like, I'm so sorry. They're like this. They're not always like this or whatever. Like if they're ruining the movie for everyone else and give some kind of visible struggle or resistance against it, even if it's a losing battle, like try. Even <laughs> just pretend. Just pretend. Yeah. No, <laughs> don't do that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there should be an acknowledgement that you're aware other people are being bothered by the people you're responsible for, right? But that was not the case here. The mom, for the first 10 minutes, tried and then just gave up and watched the movie. The dad, this is the worst thing <laughs> I've ever fucking seen. I nearly, I nearly started a fight with him. He had his fucking laptop out. He had his laptop. He was working <laughs> on full brightness, by the way. He was working in the cinema. Like, the cinema... Fuck me. The cinema is not wow. your babysitter. It is a shared experience for people to come and enjoy new movies with other people. If you're not there to do that, or even if you're a parent there to facilitate your child and their friends to do that, don't go to the cinema. You're being a shit parent. Also, I'm calling this guy out, right? These were shit parents because you're being a shit parent by not even trying to teach your child 
how to enjoy a movie and not need to run around. You're being a shit cinema goer by not giving a shit if your lazy parenting ruins the experience for everyone else there. And by working in the cinema while trying to mind 15 kids, you're also being a shit worker. That is a man who is failing at that moment in time on every level of life they are attempting. It is gross incompetence on multiple fronts within the span of just a few hours. And above all else, it's just a fucking dick move on every single person in that moment you could potentially impact all because you're not arsed getting your shit together. It was a fucking disgrace. But guess what? <laughs> I still really enjoyed the movie. It didn't ruin the movie, which I think says a lot for the movie as well. And I want to discuss that. We're going to talk Wicked. We're going to talk Gladiator. It's a huge month. So we have to be vicious in some of the movies we cut. There are some excellent movies that would have probably been our movies in a month that we have to just cut right out of this. But we still don't know what each other's movie of the month is. So let's get to November at the movies. Tom, I need to take a break from talking, clearly, because that yelling did me <laughs> no good. Tom, what's your movie of the month? This, yeah, this was a really tough month. Um, there's honestly like two or maybe three movies that I think would have a good show to being that movie in a month. In fact, if it was a lesser month, I think any of these movies would have been a worthy winner. But it came down to one movie for me, um, and it was the movie Enora. Yeah, um, same, which, same. Yeah, yes. I mean, it was it was close. There was ones I really enjoyed this month, but I thought it was just really creative and weird and interesting and I, I should say by the way this is our christmas episode mm. so i have done my due diligence and i've created a little christmas cracker joke for all these movies and okay. i just want to highlight they're meant to be bad okay i i, I didn't necessarily <laughs> come up at all i didn't necessarily come up with all of these either by the way some of them you know there's some furious googling but and this okay. is this is one that's this is really just hitting with my um people in my local area i don't know if this is going to work this might go over the head of, of people from the rest of ireland do you hear they're remaking Anora in Cork? It's going to be called Tanora. That yeah, it's that was sorry. I sure just had to it's cut out his laughing there. Sorry, yeah, it's, very it's impressive. First, yeah, I was laughing so loud <laughs> unless you were watching the video where he could see my reaction that my audio actually cut out because stunned it... into silence he was. <laughs> <laughs> This oh. is just the first movie got you there. Every movie, really, every <laughs> <laughs> everyone has yeah, a long way down, baby. Um, but yeah, look, uh, and Nora, like this is one that I that I've been talking about for a while. Yes. Um, when I when I was like, it's coming out, it's coming out, it's coming out, it's coming out, and um, I I I think it absolutely delivered despite all that. I think what really um was I found really interesting was as much as I was excited for this movie and I'd seen, you know, some of the marketing and I'd heard about the reaction it had got at Cannes and all these, you know, obviously it won the Palm Door there. I didn't really know what it was. Mm -hmm. Like, I just was like, oh, it's Mikey Madsen and she's like a stripper and she gets, you know, stuck in with some uh, some guy, who's Russian guy who's kind of connected. That was all I knew. I didn't know if this was drama, comedy, and I got a lot more out of it because of that, because there mm -hmm. are moments of drama, but it was really funny, <laughs> like yeah. way more than I expected it to. Like there was a point watching this movie where the whole cinema was just laughing for a good minute straight, where I was at the <laughs> point where I'm like, I actually am, I'm kind of missing what's happening next year because people are just still laughing. Um, but it is also uh, quite, quite dark. Uh, there is that kind of underbelly to it. But I think what's already impressive about Sean Baker as a, as a filmmaker is like, he always manages to do a good job of like putting the magnifying glass onto like kind of underserved, people in the world you know like uh you know we're following kind of a sex worker here and a lot of movies have treated them historically really bad um and he kind of does it in a way that's kind of reverential and interesting and shows the kind of human side of them uh and i think because of that the character that um of anora that's uh mikey madison's playing is is really an excellent character she's a character that they they always manage to show as really really strong despite the fact she's often in a situation where she's kind of in ways powerless um, I thought she gave a fantastic performance. Like I'm not, I, I'm familiar uh, with Mikey Madsen from like the Scream movies. I know I've seen her in a few other things as well. But this is like, forget about it. Like this is star making turn. Like she is like on the the map now. Uh, like no one's business. And I also think that it's a movie that 
uh, puts a lot of spotlight on actors that, again, where you're like, he, apparently this, these are actors who are well known in like Russia and Eastern Europe. There's a, there's a not zero percent chance that some of these actors I could see getting like nominations at the at the award season. Like we have a character um called uh, Igor played by Yora Borisov, who's like just a henchman character, and he is incredibly scary at times, but also incredibly hilarious. And like the the dynamic between him uh, and Anora is one of the most interesting aspects of the movie, um because we see a character kind of go from hatred and kind of being this kind of useless henchman that we don't expect to really be a fully formed character to being a really interesting character in general um there's lots of other characters in this that are just that it feels like they just put in the extra amount of effort to make them interesting like especially with the characters like our henchmen in movies they're so so easy can just throw them aside and they can just be you know a heavy or pointless character they did a great job here and i think like if you were to compare this movie to other movies it's a, it's a weird one. It's like a, a, a fantastic mixture between maybe an uncut gems, hustlers, uh, Fargo, um, and mm, there was another one in there that's that slipped in my mind. But those are kind of what I would like. Again, all great films, all fairly different. Mm. Uh, so putting them all together, uh, surprisingly, really, really worked. Uh, my only criticism is that maybe it's a little bit long. Uh, it's about two hours twenty minutes. I did kind of think towards the end it was like okay wrap it up a bit now but i was never bored and the movie always managed to, to kind of win me over um it, it's a very stressful film at times like it, it, it's, it's very 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 tense um but i was never bored watching it uh, i was always entertained i got into the drama aspect of it uh even the kind of I, I mean calling it like a romance which is kind of what the genre on like you know the the label is uh, on imdb and wikipedia saying it's may, maybe a little bit of a stretch i mean there's romance elements to it and I thought it was very clever watching it because I was like, ah, oh, it's like a fairy tale. And then I walked out of the cinema and looked at the poster and was like, it literally says that in the poster, Tom. It literally says that. You probably saw that earlier. They ignored it and 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 were like, yeah, you're so clever. Pat on the back. <laughs> it, um, but it, it does have that kind of fairy like uh, fairy tale like quality to it uh, that really works. But it does that in a in a warped sense in that it's you know full of sex, nudity, drugs, violence, but not in a way that I felt felt egregious like a lesser movie would have. Um, I think yeah, this is one that. It's it's going to be interesting seeing how this does at award season because it's not the usual kind of thing the Academy would go for. I think it is kind of a little bit odd. It is a little bit weird and 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 funny and kind of dare I say taboo in the wrong, even though it's not. You know what I mean? But it deals with taboo subject matter. But I think it's excellent. I would implore anyone to check this out um, because yeah, no, it's a it's a really really interesting comedy, um, uh, dark comedy, uh, in the time where we don't really necessarily get these type of movies anymore there's a lot of debate lately about kind of where the comedy film genre has gone it kind of has warped into something like this and i think it's the better for it if it's giving us movies like an aura yeah i i i echo a lot of what to say and obviously this is my movie of the month but one thing i'd say is that i didn't find this difficult like i saw this this is one of the first movies i saw in november and I was like, that's not going to be B. And it wasn't. And and I get what you're saying, because November was a really strong month for movie of the month. But for me, it was a case of, if an aura wasn't here, this would be the movie of the month. You know what I mean? And, and that's where I struggled a little bit. Um, For me, I, I, I though this was clear, and I think it's going to clean up at awards, because I think it is... It is different, but it's different in that kind of way Hollywood fancies itself as we're being cool and voting to different movies. Like they gave everything everywhere. Everything out of all at once as well, as you were saying. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and, that, and that, that Parasite as well. They'll do that every few years, like where it's like, we're going to give a cool movie. And that's what this is. It's written and directed, obviously, by Sean Baker, following up on the excellent Red Rocket. Um, for anyone who hasn't seen it or doesn't know much about it, um, it's inspired by... Uh, an actual kind of Russian-American newlywed who was kidnapped and wanted to uh, humanize sex workers. Actually, Baker hired a former sex worker turned actress and writer, Andrea Verhun, as a consultant for this. Uh, it's the first American movie to win a Pandora can since uh, The Tree of Life in 2011. Um, Mikey Madsen was cast in the lead role without having to audition after performances in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and Scream. And I was actually kind of worried coming into this movie because in reading up on the background to it, like they didn't have an intimacy consultant on this because like apparently Baker and his wife 
were very <laughs> I don't know, they're very hands on in crafting. Yeah, it's a very, it's a great weird dynamic between yeah, the two it sounded of them. Like, yeah. And and I read all that before I was going in, and I'm like, is this gonna be weird? Like, but it was it wasn't, it wasn't, it was weird in all the right ways. Um, I agree with all the comps you had, but for me, what came to mind is like one, it's like a prestige Zola for anyone who's seen I, that movie. I just I was about to cut you off. I was going to say, yeah. I forgot to mention Zola. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a prestige movie of that. Also, it reminded me quite a lot of a Tarantino early kind of caper. Um, yeah. But like, what if that happened? And and this is where I think it, it, it reaches into Oscar territory because it has all the fun and excitement and action. And what it reminded me of in a Tarantino caper is Tarantino, especially in the early days, if you think of John Travolta and, and, and Sam Jackson in, in, for me, the greatest movie of all time, Pulp Fiction, okay? It's like, what if stuff went wrong while you're being this badass hitman? You know, and that's what Tarantino was interested in. And that's what this movie is very much interested in. But where Tarantino kind of goes off into the nerdy, which I love and appreciate. He's my favorite filmmaker. Um, Sean Baker likes to get into the emotional side of things, okay? What if this caper went wrong? It would be funny for this, this, and this reason. There's a big debate, and again, to bring up Kermit and Mayo uh, and be a proper fanboy, um, they're having a big debate over whether the, the home invasion scene, that by the way, uh, the film, by the way, was shot in 37 days. Um, the home invasion scene is kind of the signature piece of it, uh, and, and kind of what you've probably seen of this, if you've seen any ads, you've, that's kind of the thing that's stuck with you um there's a debate around whether that's funny or not and for me i'm like yes it's a comedy scene it's like it's not a debate it is a comedy scene it is designed to be funny but it's not funny in the tarantino sense of uh brad pitt throwing a paint bucket at a woman and that being funny because it's so unexpected where it's kind of disturbingly funny it's funny because this small punchy stripper is like at every stage out fighting and out thinking all of the goons and they're so hapless in being able to trap her and that's what made it funny but it's also disturbing in the same way that's the core of what makes this movie work the humor in it all also lies hand on hand with the drama of it all because at the, at the end of it it's a character study on Anora, and it's very empathetic towards her character um she's an instinctively sassy kind of person and we get a lot of we get a real good insight into what life is like working in a strip club like they're bitching about the clients they have they're kind of being uh you know their boss isn't gonna win manager of the year he's just a guy um saying not politically correct stuff to the girls um and Anora is kind of she is she's got that sass and fight in her from growing up in that world and rage is her first defense mechanism but at her core she was kind of built that way by a cruel world where her boss just knew her as the Russian girl. Even though she's not Russian, she can just speak Russian, but that's her identity in the place she spends most of her time. And in this movie, she's put in a position where she's kind of taunted with the prospect of getting a better life and a route out of that. And then that's just ripped away from her out of nowhere. And what this movie, what makes it different from Tarantino movies is Sean Baker is interested in going, how would she feel? How would that impact her? How would she react? And we see her lash out, but then there's a scene and I won't give any details around it. I'll just tell you about the impact of the cinema because my cinema was very much like yours, Tom, of constant laughter throughout the movie because it is very, very funny. The dialogue's very funny yeah, and the acting is fantastic, but also very realistic. So you, you feel like you're in this situation with these people. But then the movie ended in stunned silence. Like we just watched Schindler's List. Yeah. And to do that, to have people who are just enjoying this romp and like uh, what I don't like about the debate about is it a comedy or not? Is it funny or not? It's like, yes, it's funny, but it's taking people who are there for the funny and it's making them at the end think about the impact on this person and what yeah. happens when all of that falls down. And that is brilliant because like it makes space 
for emotion. It makes space for realism. It makes space for character. It makes space for empathy. It makes space for humanization. And that's what makes this different, but never in a preachy way. It's such an easy watch. It's something you can find yourself constantly going back to. It is fantastic. It is my favorite Sean Baker piece. I'm not saying something because I love everything he does. Um, I loved seeing, uh, you, you mentioned Igor there, Yura Borisov. Uh, I saw him in um, compartment number six and he was fantastic in that. He plays really complex characters well. Like he can play, you know, you have your notions about this person and he can just really play with that. And he did it in comp compartment number six and he did it even better here because he had to be comedic in it without having jokes to say. Um, I thought he was fantastic. I thought Mikey Madsen absolutely knocked it out of the park. And I thought this movie, the next show we're on, we won't be doing December at the movies. We'll be doing our top 10 movies of the year. I'm going to be talking about this in that. Like, I'm not going to give it in a way about where it'll be, yeah. but it, it, it jumped straight in there. And, and for me, even in this, absolute gauntlet of a month where all the like that we had essentially this year's version of barbenheimer dropping glicked um although it didn't release on the same day over here which makes that awkward um but we had these huge movies and these really like we're getting into award season as well so we're getting these really under the radar movies as well that are excellent Nothing came close to this. It was fantastic. I loved it. That's a Nora. So uh, please, guys, do yourself a favor and check it out. Um, Let's get on to the big movies. First off, we're, let's talk about Gladiator 2. Okay. Ridley Scott returning with a long-awaited sequel to his 2000 epic. Many people's one of their favorites of all time. This time, it's directed uh, off a David Scarper script. He wrote Napoleon for Ridley uh, off a story he created with Peter Craig. Uh, Derek Jacoby and Connie Nielsen reprised their roles from the first movie, but otherwise, it's a totally new cast headed up by Paul Meskel, then to Washington, Pedro Pascal. Um, it's not new news. It's been spoken about a lot, but I feel like I do want to bring it up. The uh, sequel has been the work since around 2001. Um, there was at one stage a script written by Nick Cave. Yes, that Nick Cave, um, who's a friend of Russell Crowe, <laughs> that saw uh, Maximus in purgatory sent back to kill Jesus and the apostles, ending Christianity. Uh, he failed to do that, and he was then cursed to live forever. And as a result, he fights in World War II, Vietnam. And then at the end of the movie, again, this is never going to get made, so spoilers, but at the end of the movie, he works in the Pentagon. <laughs> and I would just fucking love... I want that movie. I need that movie. I need to cut to him just checking his phone in his little cubicle. <laughs> I'm like, that's Maximus. I'm glad he got his phone. Are you not entertained? Uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, literally, he's on Tinder trying to be entertained left <laughs> and right. <laughs> um, there's a lot going on here. Uh, Hans Zimmer didn't return after uh, passing off the score to a former assistant, to Harry Gregson Williams, but there's a lot of the original DNA here. Tom, did it live up to the original? No. <laughs> <laughs> but before we get into that, here's a bit of levity because I think we need a bit of a break before okay. after the darkness of Anora. And by the way, I don't think you understood the last joke. Tenora is a drinking cork. That's that's why it, it that's why you didn't laugh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, I'm yeah, just, see, I worked, totally works. My cork. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God. okay, okay. Um, you get me back. You get me. I got you with this one, right? Okay, this one actually needs a bit of participation as well. So, <clears throat> what did the hungry cannibals feel like after he ate a woman? I don't know, Tom. What did the hungry cannibal feel like after he ate a woman? Gladiator. <laughs> okay, okay, how, okay. How did he feel when he went back for a second? Like, what did he say when he went back for seconds? I, I, I don't know. What did he say? Well, what's the movie we're doing? Gladiator 2. No, he's, he said thanks. He's got manners. He's a mannerly cannibal. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, what we well call played. baiting the hook, everybody. Well played, well played. Okay, you got me back. You're back on track. Okay, oh, we're good. <laughs> we're, we're one all right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, like, Gladiator, I, I do like the original Gladiator, but I also think it kind of was one of those movies that attracted, you know, some of the worst people. They're like, yeah, there's my favorite movie. And I'm like, it is really, really good, and there's a lot I admire about it. And I think I respect it a lot more having seen Gladiator 2 now. <laughs> um, in a weird way 
this um, is what it could have been exactly yeah like this is it's so weird that this is a ridley scott movie because if you hadn't told me this feels like the most studio soul-sucking legacy sequel of a gladiator movie you know like it has all the hallmarks of one of those things where it's just like they do a lot of weird awkward connections to the original that i'm not going to spoil but honestly undermine parts of the original film for me um i actually think there's things in it that just didn't really work at all um i I should also mention like the the first gladiator if i if i had any flaws but i couldn't take any flaws with the way it looks uh the massive scope of it the cinematography is amazing the cinematographer of gladiator 2 just came out and shit on ridley scott i don't know if you saw that no. He was literally like Ridley Scott is like lazy and and like over the work now. He's basically like he has all these cameras going and that doesn't make it better. He's la- like like this is the man who is like promoting the movie that's in cinemas that he just shot, and he <laughs> tore into Ridley Scott. He's like he's lazy now, and I was like, yeah, I don't know if he's lazy. It does feel like Ridley Scott is kind of just like it's amazing that we're still getting Ridley Scott movies at his mm. age, but it's it also said- feels like Ridley. You can you can take a bit of a break. You can like think this out. You can you can you can choose projects selectively because it just feels like it's scattershot. It feels it's yeah. like Ridley Scott is afraid that if he stops working, he's going to die. And every script that comes in his post box, he's just like that. Ah, make it green light. Um, because again, and you mentioned the the sequel that we could have gotten, and that was always one of those bonkers Hollywood things where I was like, man, did you hear what that could have been? That is at least something interesting. This movie just wasn't interesting for me. Um, it's it's just a movie that feels like they kind of went through a lot of the steps of the last one and they did it in a worse way. I don't think there's any aspect of this movie that is better than the first movie, um, to be honest. Like, there is Paul Mescal, who I, I, I like Paul Mescal. I think he's a good actor. I personally think, and I don't think this is necessarily a popular take, I think he was miscast here. Um, he, I, I don't think like if you look at someone like a Russell Crowe he's kind of got that anger inside him that just kind of radiates out of him Paul Mescal has moments where he kind of feels like he's meant to be that kind of character and I think it just falls flat he feels very measured in his performance and I don't think it always works there are scenes where it does work but as it, as it goes later in the film I don't feel it works at all Um, we have uh, the, the person who probably would be the more interesting character in the movie which is Pedro Pascal's character he is fantastic in this. Uh, I really liked his character. We also have Denzel Washington, who is a, again, a really, really interesting character. He steals every scene he's in, but like, if you were like, is what, what about what do you know about that like character in general? I'm like, that's it's Denzel Washington. <laughs> like, if he is like Denzel Washington, was just like putting on a robe, and they were like, yeah, Denzel, just just be yourself, buddy. Um, it's it's literally it's literally training day with Togas. Yeah. Yeah, and I was, and I, listen, I was fine with that because it totally I, it was great. Like, I Denzel, enjoyed Denzel it. Denzel is the man, like. <laughs> I really liked it. I'm like, yeah. oh, I'm, apparently I want to watch Dragon Day with Tolkien. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have like the twin uh, kind of emperors played by Joseph Quinn and Fred Hetchinger. Um, I like that dynamic, but it also kind of did feel like, well, how do we make sure this is totally different to the last one? Two emperors. Too fast, two gladiator. Too glad, two gladiator. Two emperors. <laughs> Double everything. This time there's there's monkeys. This time the baboons are crazy and possibly drugged up. This time there's sharks in the Colosseum. And you're all like, what? Whoa. Restraint is allowed. <laughs> okay. And sometimes welcome. Because even in some of the big action set pieces, and I think they generally quite enjoyable, all the scenes I preferred and remembered were the smaller, more intimate battle scenes. Like... Mm-hmm. It's a big, cal- the big one everyone's talking about was like the Colosseum gets flooded in the sharks and both battles. And like, that's, yeah, there's elements of that that are true. But I thought it was such a dull sequence to watch. Like visually, I didn't think it was very interesting. I thought like the action of it, there was no real stakes because it felt like, it, it felt like plot armor. You know, there's people just firing multiple arrows and there's just not even like where you're like, that character is just exposed. There's no logic put into this. It just feels like they thought about it afterwards. And that's, again, something his cinematographer said was that really is now like, about to shoot and they're like hey there's a load of stuff there that we should get out and he's like clean it up after <laughs> like oh okay i i just thought it wasn't a very interesting movie like there's mm. parts of it that i'm kind of already forgetting i think the most interesting story is 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 the one that um that is going on with pedro pascal and denzel washington i feel like their stories are a lot more interesting than the central character i feel like central character was kind of dull and it feels like kind of a repeat of 
the, the original gladiator um mm -hmm. uh, yeah i don't know i just I, and again i see i've i spoke to a lot of people and a lot of people who really enjoyed it thought it was really good i don't get it um maybe it's just because it feels like we've got plenty of historical epics uh you know since the original gladiator that i thought were decent or or it feels like this is just more of the same but to a lesser <laughs> to lesser success i don't know i I was pretty disappointed with it i didn't necessarily have high hopes for it anyway but i thought it would be better than this okay tom the key to never being disappointed is to never expect anything and <laughs> the fact that gladiator 2 was happening told me all i needed to know about what this was because gladiator there were no outstanding questions from gladiator 1 it Told its story, and I I like Gladiator. I I think it is a I think it is an excellent movie. I rewatched it coming into this, and I hadn't watched it in a few years. And I'm like, yeah, this, this is as good as I remember. It. And what I liked about Gladiator was that it's kind of an alternate history based off like certain real characters, um, like Joaquin Phoenix character, the original emperor as well. They they're all real Roman emperors, like and. Um, based off their ideas, and it's just a twist, but not like a Tarantino style twist where they kill Hitler. You know what I mean? It's well, yeah. it's actually not a million miles off now that I think about it. Um, but uh, you're like, oh, I could see that actually happening. You know what I mean? But they've done really well to make this Hollywood at the same, but they haven't sold out Rome, and they've they've achieved quite a lot in this, and it's also just a really thrilling cinema like popcorn movie at the same time like it, it takes a lot of boxes there were no outstanding questions here so and and when you hear the story of the idea that they actually farmed out and had scripted you're like right that's the level that we're playing at they just want to make this movie again and they don't care how they do it now they did reject that idea but they were like the fact that you know Russell Crowe died at the end of the original Gladiator. Not a spoiler, it's 20 years, 23 years. Um, but the fact that his solution was, yeah, just bring him back to life. And I'm like, they don't care. So I didn't expect them to care here. So I was in for the cinematic experience and I was in for the randomness of it all, you know? And I was rooting for Paul Mescal as well. And I was like, how's Denzel Washington going to fit into this movie? And apparently it, it was the, I was asking the wrong question. It is, how is this movie going to fit Denzel Washington? Because <laughs> he just was Denzel and I loved it. It was wild. Um, I, I don't feel the, I wouldn't go as far as to say Paul Mescal was miscast. I just think he was in a different movie. Like I think Denzel was in a different movie to everyone else, but also Denzel's kind of the best part about this movie. So I felt that just threw everything off. You know what I mean? Paul Mescal's in what he perceived as the sequel to Gladiator 2. Pedro Pascal is such a good actor. He fits into any role that he plays. So he fit in there. Denzel... And then, you, so you have Denzel versus Paul Mescal, and they're playing two completely different movies and two completely different perceptions of this. Denzel's going, wouldn't it be God's if it was just Denzel? And Paul Mescal's going, I have to channel the, like, the it, like the feeling of Russell Crowe, but I'm also an interior actor and stuff like that. And I'm like, you overthought it. You overthought it, mate. The sharks in the Coliseum. Like, you've overthought this by trying. <laughs> and, like, so... I, I wouldn't root against it. It's just Denzel threw this off so much, but then there's the memeability factor and we started following along that when it became clear that this movie couldn't be taken seriously. I watched this in Odeon Leicester Square uh, in a big fuck off with the old Empire the Theatre. Watched it in the theatre setting with the, and I got like a big fuck off uh, bag of popcorn and this and that and the other. And I had a really fun time watching this I, the sound of it in IMAX was breathtaking seeing it on the huge gigantic screen but it's not a good movie by any stretch of the imagination it's a fun movie it reminds me a bit of Napoleon um really Scott's last project and it's like okay this is palpably ridiculous on so many different levels but like I, i'm kind of into ridley scott just saying fuck it this is one of the defining filmmakers of our generation and now he's just having fun and making fun movies because he's just like he's just like who cares it's a cinema it's just let's just and just can make I, can I ask, on, on that napoleon comparison because I, I i was thinking napoleon as well because obviously that was like our last <laughs> big historical film did you prefer this or napoleon 
See, I, I don't know. I kind of like them both. Napoleon okay. didn't interfere with the original Gladiator for me, so it doesn't lose mm, any okay. marks. There's nothing to lose. I also really like the randomness of Wacky Phoenix in as Napoleon. Yeah, like that's that's what I mean. I thought like Napoleon. I thought was there were some interesting choices, often weird and necessarily bad choices, and there were some battle scenes in that where were really amazing. Whereas I think this kind of missed a lot of things that could be epic or interesting about it. Like, yeah, but then there's stuff like why were the monkeys there? What, how did they think the sharks got into the Colosseum? Like, I like this for the wrong reasons. And none of it has okay. to do with it being a good movie. You know what I mean? It's it's a meme of a movie, but I enjoyed it. And the battle sequence, the sequences they needed to hit worked, but they're not working for the sake of, like, oh, this is really emotionally changing me or this is having an impact on me. It's like, this is cool to watch on a big, loud screen. And when I engage, when I watch it with my 12 year old brain, I enjoy it. But that's the thing. I went in with no expectations because okay. as soon as I saw Gladiator 2, I'm like, that's what this is. That's who this is. If I expect anything out of Ridley Scott, I'm going to be disappointed at this stage. Okay. But if, if I'm like, he can make cool stuff go bang then he can do that. <laughs> and if that's all I want, that's all I get. And that's what I got. So I had a fun time. <laughs> Fair enough, I suppose. I would say the film kind of reminded me of, and it's never a good sign when I when this film pops into my head if I'm watching a movie. Kind of got a bit of a Star Wars prequel vibe off this, to be honest, times. Mm. <laughs> uh, I was, and I then maybe it was just... A, there was a few can... kind of fighting in the sequels, uh, in the Coliseum scenes that were very on the nose with that stuff. But then there was a lot of Linking things together that I don't think necessarily fit. Um, I don't know. It was fine, but I don't think I'm ever going to watch it again. Like, so you said prequel. Yeah. Oh, we're gonna get into a debate because I think the Star Wars prequels are actually underrated. But anyway, <laughs> you're, you're I talking knew about. I was, I was like, I was, I was yeah. like, this is dangerous water. Yeah, I don't no, know what you're thinking yeah. about the prequels. You're gonna, yeah, we're, we're, <laughs> we're gonna have a completely different discussion if we go down that rabbit hole. We don't have time because there's so much to discuss. Let's discuss. Wicked next, which is something that personally, I know you're a big musical guy, so I imagine we had two different experiences. I've spoken about my in cinema experience. I'm, I'm going to leave that there and just talk about the movie now. I had no Wicked experience. So if you listening are like me, um, I'll give you some background to it. Okay, so it's an adaptation of a stage musical by Stephen Swartz and Winnie uh, Holzman, the latter of which co-wrote uh, the movie with Dana Fox for John M. Tew to direct. That was adapted for stage in 2003 uh, from the Gregory Maguire novel Wicked, The Life and Times of the Wicked Witch in the West. So it is the Wicked Witch in the West's origin story. Part one to two has been highly publicized. It wasn't a surprise going in, unlike the likes of Dune. Um, covers the musical's first act and is the uh, like I said the origin story um it's something that's had a bit of a tortured production this has been the work since 2012 although Cynthia Revo and Ariana Grande uh, and John Chu were signed up in 2021 uh, and then it was delayed due to cats getting priority over this which is wild uh, and also due to COVID and then the writer's strike uh, it is one of the it's the fourth longest Broadway show in history running over 20 years it's won three Tony Awards um, and there's a lot of like like you've probably seen the interviews with Grande and, and Cynthia and they are memes in themselves um, but they're taking this very seriously Revo kind of uh, put in a lot of requests around Alfalba's costume Alfalba by the way is uh, named that way because the original uh, yeah exactly yeah Frank Palm um, but she put in a lot of requests around kind of the costume and stuff like that as well so they're really putting their heart and soul into this uh, it was, decision was made in 2022 to split the movie in two to avoid cutting out songs and characters but actually they've made it into five hours and what is probably actually a shorter Broadway play than the first movie um, so there's a lot of padding here uh, the vocals were recorded live on set at the insistence of Arrivo and Grande um, and they had the sound recorder from Les Mis as well. Um, and yeah, it's there's been a relentless marketing campaign. You've seen this movie advertised. You've heard about it. It went from the Super Bowl to the Oscars to the Olympics. There's a huge array of merchandise in this. There's some controversy in the build-up to this as well. The Revo got into arguments with fans online. It's a baggy movie in itself. And it's coming into it with baggage. Tom, 
I don't know if you've seen Wicked before. You're the more musical orientated of us, so I'll, I'll kind of give you can give your perception from that standpoint, and I'll give my perception from coming in totally cold to this. Yeah, I have seen music, the Wicked twice actually. I saw it uh, on the West End, and I saw it when I was in Dublin recently. Um, first things, one question: What's Dorothy's favorite band? I forgot this is Toto. Ah, I like it. Bless yeah, the rains yeah, down in yeah. Africa. Um, yeah. <laughs> right. Anyway, um, yes, I saw Wicked twice. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I think Wicked is a very interesting musical um, for different reasons. Um, I think it's very much for a lot of people. It can be kind of a gateway musical. Um, it is very accessible because everyone has a, a vague idea of the Wizard of Oz story. In fact, when I have like, if I'm talking to younger kids and they're like, oh, I saw a show, it's nearly always Wicked um, because it's it's a crowd pleaser. Um, it has songs that are some pretty memorable songs. It has a lot of spectacle. Um, and that's kind of what set it apart for me. The first time I saw it, I actually did not love it. Um, I thought it was okay. I was blown away by a lot of the production aspects. Second time I saw it, I, was, I softened to it a lot more. I actually do quite enjoy it. My my approach to this was really interesting because, uh, as you said, like this is um, way longer than like the whole <laughs> the whole musical. The whole musical is like two and a half hours, and that includes like an interval. Mm -hmm. So like this is already longer than the whole musical with an interval. Um, so. I think the biggest compliment I can actually give it is that the padding that you see in this isn't always really blatant. It didn't feel like forceful padding. There were scenes obviously in it where I was like, oh, that's new or, oh, this is going on a little bit longer. But I think they actually did an admirable job adapting it. And you just mentioned Cats, like the movie musicals coming from stage uh, can often be really, really bad um, yeah. because it, it, there's a really hard balance to get between just filming the show as is, and then you're not adapting it for the medium of a film, or else going too far from what made the musical special. This is probably one of the best musical adaptations I've seen probably since, like, I mean, Chicago is one that I always jump to that I think is an amazing adaptation. But, like, this is outstanding. Um, I thought this was excellent. Uh, I really did. And again, I went in as, I would say, a casual Wicked fan. Uh, I was not expecting it to be good based on the build-up at last while I was like, this is going to be unnecessary padding. I wasn't sure about Ariana Grande uh, as Linda. Uh, I wasn't really familiar with Cynthia Revivo, if I'm honest. And again, we had all the, the controversy of the press tour and I was like, God, oh, they just seem a bit mean girlish and I'm not a fan of that. Uh, but also acknowledging that that was probably a lot of the media just, you know, tearing them down a little bit. I Yeah, I thought this was excellent. Um, I feel like they did a really good job of uh, making the world of Oz really interesting and fascinating. Like I said, the big part of the musical is the spectacle. And I feel like they did that without it feeling hollow and, uh, and gaudy, um, which is interesting because I just mentioned the Sarah's prequels and I saw an article about that during the week where they were basically like, Wicked is what the, is the Sarah's prequel to the world of Oz, where it's like going on with the visuals and the dynamic and all that stuff. But I won't go into that. I do think the music in this uh, it's mixed in a strange way. I, I think, you know, a lot of musicals, and it is kind of an effect of Les Mis, which is that a lot of the live singers thing now because I think that gets awards. It doesn't always have to be that way, though. I feel like there are times where the music in this feels a little bit like it could have been sweetened a bit, a bit mixed a little bit better. But I feel like overall the songs in it were really, really well done. I have to say, uh, like, both of the, the women in this, uh, Cynthia and uh, Ariana, uh, you know, I'm on first name terms with them, obviously, um, were uh, excellent. Uh, I thought they had such a great dynamic. Uh, and I feel like uh, the Alphabet character is is always the meaty role. It's a, it's an easy character to uh, to kind of latch on to. Um, and that because of that, it was that easy. The Glinda character can really easily at times just be kind of grating and annoying. She's funny, but she's also really, really annoying. And I when I saw Ariana Grande, I was like, I don't know if I like Ariana Grande that much. And I also don't know if I want her for that role. I know she passionately lobbied for this role. There's like, she's been saying this like half her life that she wants to play this role. I, I like, I have to just eat my fucking words. Like, I, I like Ariana Grande, take a bow. Like, like yeah. I was not familiar with your game. She is perfect in this. Um, she just knows exactly what the assignment is. Um, hilarious. Um, there, there's a, a few things they kind of like added that, uh, that made it even funnier for her that, that I just really enjoyed. Um, a lot of the songs in this that were songs that I'd actually heard before, I was like, 
not sure if I care that much about that song. And then afterwards, I was like, actually, you know what? I actually do like that song. That song is actually a banger. I take it back. Um, it's pro- possibly a movie that goes a little bit too long. I don't say I ever got too bored, but because it was at the time where I was starting to get a bit bored, and then it moved on. Um, like there's aspects of it where it feels like they're in one setting for too long, and by the time you get to the other setting, it fe- can feel a little bit more rushed. I would say. That would be a very minor thing. I would say pacing wise, it's it's very admirable, especially considering it's such a mammoth musical they made here. Uh, there's also like other great performances. Jonathan Bailey in this, a, a guy who I, again I was not familiar with, yeah, is ex- excellent as this kind of you know character that you think is kind of this himbo character, um, but does a really good job with it. Um, we also have you know uh, turns from uh, Jeff Goldblum, who we don't get much of in this. Uh, we will get more of in part two. Uh, but again, I mean, like, assuming someone's like, hey, they got Jeff Goldman to play the Wizard of Oz. You're like, done, sold, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I thought visually it was amazing. I thought the songs were really good. The performance were really good. I thought they nailed the chemistry between Elphaba and Linda, which basically this movie doesn't work without it. Um, mm. There's, uh, since this is a part two, and I feel like you can't, you can't talk about this without kind of speculating about part two, because uh, that's, I'm very worried about the second part. <laughs> because... Um, comparatively, the second act is shorter than the first. It's like an hour long. Um, the second act is kind of the stuff that we often hate about prequels, which is like, hey, and this character is this character, and this is where they got this from. There's a lot of that in the second act. Uh, I also think some of the songs aren't as strong in the second act. Um, there is some good ones in there, but I think overall the songs aren't as strong. The dynamic that they do such a good job building up in this one is less of a focus in the second one between uh, the two witches. Uh, and I don't know how they're going to pad it as much. Uh, I've already heard an interview with uh, the director where he said um, Dorothy, you know, Dorothy's kind of an unseen character pretty much in in Wicked. You kind of hear her off screen once and you don't even really hear what she's saying. He kind of hinted that she might become a character um, uh... in the second act. So there's aspects of it that made me worry for the second part. But for what this is, I mean, it's already doing uh, an amazing amazing box office um i think it's well deserving i think it's going to play until christmas honestly as someone who does love musicals i have to i'd have I haven't officially put together my top 10 but i could see it getting really close honestly and that that i would never have expected this is a real pleasant surprise for me yeah interesting okay i came into this completely cold but at the same time and this isn't something that i've actually spoken about that much because when you get a chance to talk about the wizard of oz but the wizard of oz movie is a large reason why I'm here because and I imagine a lot of people feel the same so I'm not breaking any like just when you watch that as a kid and how it just blows your mind with the endless possibility of what you're watching just even just starting off as a black and white movie and then exploding into this explosion of colour and and kind of then the, the songs and everything else and the, the story and the moral and it's just a, a near perfect movie if not perfect Um, I've never really got into the supplementary content just because again like why I like that is I like that like I'm not it's not the story I don't need more info and I, I've, I, anything else feels kind of exploitative as well so I've kind of avoided it like I, I remember I watched like a couple of episodes of the Oz TV show and I'm like this is just ridiculous like why is there a prison like what that's not, I'm not this is nothing to do with it nothing to do with the fucking wizard it's a joke and I don't care if they made it make sense in the end I just stop paying attention um, but I love this from the word go because I, I came in completely cold not knowing anything else beyond just the, the out side stuff um like the build up and so on um and it's just a simple question that like just captured me straight away why is the wicked witch like why is she wicked and i'm like yeah why actually what did i see and it's like because she's green and she cackles and she's got a boil on her face and the good witch is good because she's beautiful and i'm like I get it. I'm in. I'm in. I love those stories. I love taking a well-known story and just going, yep. And that's what they do here. And it is told, it's interesting that you brought up Mean Girls because that's what this reminded me of in that yep. it's playful. It's funny. It's, it's fucking hilarious. And the performances, like you said, get it. Ariana Grande, I don't know what they're going to do with the Oscars in terms of what they're petitioning for. Like Ariana, like, well, for me, Ariana Grande, if she gets Best Actress, I wouldn't be mad. 
It is yep. one of the performances I enjoyed most. I thought, like, Cindy Arrivo did fine, but, like, I just think there's less scope for what she can do in terms of making me enjoy this because it's a very well-worn kind of trope. But it works because it's set in this setting. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting when you make me think about this and so on. Um, I loved this. I really, really enjoyed every second of it. It surprised me. Was it perfect? No, there were some things like the lighting a lot of people talk about. Uh, for me as well, like it's got two mandates. It's like there's a fuck ton of money being put into this, obviously. Um, so I need to you to capture my imagination with modern technology and do for me what the original did with like 0.001% of that budget. And I need you to capture my imagination in a modern way. And I think it fails on that, if I'm being honest. It's not visually mm -hmm. interesting. It looks visually expensive and I appreciate the work that went into it. Like for example, John Chu mm -hmm. um, had a yellow brick road made. They planted thousands of flowers. They wanted to make it a natural kind of, so mm -hmm. it, it kept that yeah, stage it's very, very like actual constructed sets yeah. and stuff, it seems like. But, and it's weird because you say that because like uh, that, that's something that was my big concern going into because like I said, there is something lost in that, I mean, if you're seeing something on stage and it's happening before your eyes in real time versus yeah. something that you're like, oh, was that made in a computer in six months? You know, it's like, yeah, you know, and I think actually before, sorry to cut you off, but no, you're all good. The, the specific one I'm thinking of, and this is one a lot of people were curious about it, and it's very well documented that this is the end of the first movie because it's the end of the first act of the musical. Mm. To find gravity, seeing it on stage never ceases to be impressive because basically you see the witch character descend into the sky and her cloak just starts billowing out and it, you, you it, without looking at, up how they do it you're like what the hell just happened how is she up in the sky it's not like a harness she just yeah. goes and descends so i'm like that would look terrible <laughs> on yeah. film because obviously we know it was green screen and probably wires but i feel like they kind of did things that made it work at times and i think there's other times where it's not like Say, for example, we have the big head of the, the Wizard of Oz as well, right? On stage, that's really cool because it's like a physical puppet prop. Mm. Here, if, even if it is, they're just like, well, we've had, you know, nearly 20 years of Transformers movies now with big talking robot heads. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So there's aspects yeah, of that that worked you. and aspects that didn't work. I, I And there were some times where I felt like I was watching The Battle of Winterfell in Game of Thrones, where it's just really darkly lit. And I'm trying to think, I'm like, why artistically, what are they trying to say? And they're like, oh, darkness is looming generally. And I'm like, yeah, but that shouldn't be an excuse for me not to see things in the movie and to like kind of have to look closely like i'm watching it in imax like and it should be green versus pink like this is very simple lads come on like just get it right <laughs> apologies <laughs> <coughs> and i don't feel that they did um another thing that it kind of fell down on was Je jeff goldblum is where's the vods again home run casting um but i don't feel they got that right and again it's just kind of a a, a byproduct of splitting the movie in two because I imagine mm. they gave me the same proportionate amount of Jeff Goldblum in the store of the Oz in the story as they did in the stage. But then you're waiting 15 minutes in the, of an interval to get more, exactly, you know. Yeah. Whereas now I'm waiting much more, and they really swung with that character. It's it's not the same. He's not the man hiding behind the curtain. It, and I don't want to get into what he is if you haven't seen it, like, but it's very, very different. And I didn't get to enjoy it. There wasn't even a grace period of like half an hour in a long movie i'm like well we're gonna get 30 minutes of jeff goldblum being jeff goldblum they kind of just go into this new perception of us and there's yeah. no explanation or anything like that as well and it probably That's what i was gonna say yeah uh, as far as when i meant to being rushed it definitely feels like they were like and we need to set up for the next act and there's a lot of stuff there that's just you don't get enough time to enjoy yeah yeah and like for me the movie never felt too long uh, it mm -hmm. didn't feel too short either um but it did feel incomplete, you know, and 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 I kn I knew it was part one, so that's not what I'm saying. I was fully ready for it, um. So yeah, that it wasn't perfect, but I I loved watching it. I had a lot of fun, despite though that family's best attempts to ruin it, um. 
And then Defying Gravity just has been in my head since. I listen to it constantly. like, And that's my first experience with Defying Gravity, which I know is a yeah. seminal song for so many people. Um, and it hit and as intended. It was a little bit long. They they really milked it. Um, I don't know if it's that way in the in the movie or in the play, yeah. It's but... no, it's it's much longer in the in the in the um, in the movie. I think it's like yeah, maybe yeah. five or so minutes. It's about seven and a bit in the movie. I think. Yeah. Um, like they kind of feels like they stop for ages in the movie and then go back to it. Um, yeah. The uh, one thing I will I will ask as well. Uh, this is kind of more curious again for, for, for part two. You are a, a big fan of the Wizard of Oz. How are you going to feel if this kind of totally doesn't sync up with the Wizard of Oz or kind of in some ways makes you question the whole story of the Wizard of Oz or whether it actually lines up perfectly with it. Like, I know there's already moments where they've reframed what you think of a character. What if, I, like, it kind of makes the story of the Wizard of Oz make a bit less sense? I, I, I don't I don't get that. I'm not one of those people who you're not going to mess okay. with my head canon. I, I, I've i got canon boundaries. I've got really yeah. strong canon boundaries. Okay. Like, I'm like, I like the Wizard of Oz. This is not connected to the movie that I loved watching as a yeah. child. They do completely different productions and do completely different things. And I'm 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 very okay with artists taking their own perception of the story. And we're in the Lord of the Rings hopping and when me and uh Jerry uh discussed kind of some of the narrative swings that the Rings of Power TV show took from Tolkien's, I'm like, I am a guy who is happy for new creators to get into a sandbox, tell their version of a story, and I can totally just turn around and say, This is the part that I like. This is the part that I'm taking, the interesting parts that you, the ideas that you came, and I can make up my own story. And I think it's personal to everyone. So I don't um, mind them twisting or playing with it because this is not the prequel of the movie that I saw. Do you know what I mean? Okay. I know that's the narrative conceit, but it, it's not. They're not connected. Not the not. way that Star Wars is connected, that is very much a prequel. So that could mess with that because it's the same people it's the same actors it's the same creators you know if there's dna that's mixed this is two completely separate projects and if you want yeah. to play around that's fine if i want to forget it it's fine uh the prison stuff messed me up way more than this to be honest because i'm like how did they end up in it's like fucking russell crowe in the pentagon i'm like how does this happen why is maximus <laughs> working in the pentagon why is his boss bullying him and why is he allowing him to, ha to happen um <laughs> But yeah, um, let's talk about Heretic next. Um, in a busy month, it was like, what movies do we include? And this is probably one of the smaller movies, but I did want to talk through this because it's an interesting movie. Written and directed by Scott Beck and Brian Woods. Uh, it stars Hugh Grant, which is kind of the headline here. It's the second horror after 1988. Uh, the Lair of the White Worm. So he's kind of dabbling in uh, an interesting phase in his career where he's uh, taking the Hugh Grant character that we all know and love him and he's just twisting him in different directions like we saw him in Dungeons and Dragons or Paddington 2 trying to be a villain uh, and now he's in the horror realm here we open in this movie on two young Mormon missionaries uh, awkwardly making conversations as they try to convert people which is how they end up at the door of the theologian um, Hugh Grant where things begin to take a turn Um want to get your thoughts on this i just want to talk about this movie with you because i think there's it, it's an interesting one yeah it sounds very dark i think we need a joke for some levity um <laughs> so, so you, you mentioned mormons obviously they're also called latter-day saints so our joke ready what, what you get when you cross lds with lsd what a high priest <laughs> <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> Oh God! Tears I of sadness. Are, I, I, I'll give you. I think I no. Actually, no. You're not. You're you're two and two. You're two and two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. This was uh, an interesting one because I think you know I, I've been hearing about this one for for quite a while. Um. Because there was a lot of talk about like this is this is Hugh Grant in like dark dark territory. I mean, Hugh Grant is honestly having like the most interesting like resurgence as an actor in the last yes. couple of years. Where he's just like, I'm just going to do weird roles now. Because, you know, he's kind of at an age where, he, you know, he can't still be what he was in, like, the 90s. So he's just doing really interesting roles. And this is one of his most interesting ones to date, I would say. Mm. Um, it's it's uh, comes from the guys who gave us A Quiet Place, uh, Scott Beck and, and, and Brian Woods. And it's it kind of becomes a weird kind of theological debate of yeah. a horror film. Um, I want to talk about, uh, bring it back to, uh, we talked about uh, Speak No Evil uh, a couple months ago. And there was kind of a running thread in that of like, how how polite do we have to be here? It would have been the polite thing to, you know, just, you know, 
to say here, but maybe we should have left. And there's kind of a, a running kind of idea of that in here as well, where they're just like these two Mormons kind of get to a situation where they're like, we, we could have got out of this if we had been a bit more forceful. And now we're kind of stuck in this situation. Um, I I would say I really enjoyed it. I, I think it does run out of steam as a movie. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of interesting stuff in it. Um, it's sort of, <laughs> there are times where it kind of feels like your atheist mate just ragging on God a little bit. Like, we've heard it. We've heard it, man. We know. Like, you don't have to come into the, I get, you know, there's a lot of that where it's like, oh, well, did you know that this symbol and this symbol came from this religion? And you're like, yeah, yeah, we, yeah okay. And it keeps kind of going on a tangent a little bit. It's like, well, do you believe in God? Oh, well, guess what? There's loads of gods. Oh, you only believe, oh, you know. Um, although it's it's done incredibly well uh, and entertainingly, there's a I think the analogy about Monopoly is going to be uh, that's in this film is going to be probably used by atheists for for years to come. Hmm. Um, <laughs> maybe annoyingly uh, to the point that it becomes uh, you know uh, bad in and, of, in and of itself. I thought the the two uh, female leads, Sophie Thatcher and Chloe East, were excellent yes. in this. Um, again, I can't say I was familiar with their work. I, I think I'd seen one of them or two, or maybe the other one, something as well, but. Again, uh, they're they're you know kind of burgeoning actors, and they you wouldn't know it from watching them here. Uh, I thought they just had a really great. Um, again, I think they they did a, a role that could so easily could have been a nothing role, which is that oh you're just be scared, <laughs> you know. Um, and it's not that they kind of have a, a, enough uh, kind of motivation and self preservation that they make really uh, for really really interesting kind of heroines. Uh, Hugh Grant is again. He's in a weird way leaning into the Hugh Grant we kind of know. Yeah. In that it's it's Hugh Grant as like kind, you know, affable Englishman. But he's doing it in a kind of a sinister way where he's like being nice, but kind of being overly nice and yeah. kind of prodding at you. And yeah, I, I he was excellent. I mean, he's just must love his career right now. Um certainly I'm enjoying the work he's putting out. Like um uh, there's not much you can say about the kind of specifics of it because there's a, a lot of spoilery stuff in this. Um, I will say I, I saw the trailer for this a couple months ago and the, the, there was one thing in the trailer that they revealed like, straight away and I was just like, I'm in. <laughs> yeah. Like there's like, a, reveal, a reveal about what, you know, the kind of, the, the reason they enter the house and kind of a, a revelation about that. That I was just like, well, that's all I need. And you kind of think it's going one way based on that. And it never really does. It it kind of it kind of just keeps furthering a kind of a lie and kind of continues to, for them to to question their faith, um, which is interesting. Towards the end, it, it takes you know no pun intended kind of a, a leap of faith where it gets a little bit weird. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure I entirely enjoyed that bit. I I feel like it kind of got to a point where they kind of played their cards uh, uh, you know a bit too much and they didn't really know what to do with it so they just figured we kind of had to find an ending that somewhat worked and i don't think i necessarily loved it um the one of the bigger surprises this is by the way this isn't a twist tover grace was in this i was like what what the yeah. <laughs> and, and it was like old man tover grace i was like tover grace what happened to you <laughs> but yeah no i would think this is a a really uh worthwhile watch i think it's one that like when it gets onto streaming would probably be a, a big hit um, but yeah, no, it's a very, very competent horror film um, that that kind of has something to say uh, and has some some intellect about it. Um, it's not the kind of scary horror you might expect from A24, I would say. Um, but it is a very kind of a tense psychological thriller uh, about religion, which sounds weird to say. But yeah, no, I think it totally worked. In a packed month, we had some behind the scenes conversations about what do we cover and what do we not. And, and this came up because, again, it's not gonna be the movie of the year or anything like that as well like and uh, but I, I i definitely wanted to make time to discuss it because i have rants so often on here about hating shit horror that i want to give credit for horror that tries to do something different and that's what this does um you grant weaponizing his traditional affability in multiple different ways and being so game with all of it is amazing and fascinating and he is one of these actors now that at this point when you put you grant on the poster i'm there because he's so interesting in what he's doing he's having him and nicholas cage are having very interesting kind of similar um 
postscripts to the kind of their peak, I suppose, in that they're playing with the tropes that people like and they're 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 happy to kind of go with it and, and it's working almost every single time. He's like He's so perfectly suited suited to horror in so many different ways that you wouldn't have thought of until you saw it happening. Like he's monologuing at one stage and holding court like the best teacher you've ever had. Uh, and then he's terrifying you in the next second. And then he's just deflating all the tension with hilarity. And he's just toying with you and playing with you. And he's doing nothing but talking and being you, Grant. Like that's, he's doing it all with just being you, Grant. And, and he's achieving all of that. It is incredible uh to see someone just flex so much and again yeah credit to it is essentially a, a three horse kind of film it's Sophie Thatcher and Chloe East are fantastic in this you instantly understand their characters you get it they nail it and they never like they never stray from that as well the script manages to accommodate all of that as well but they they hold their own uh in there with a, an all-time or horror performance here the debate and dialogue in the first 45 minutes, I was like, if they can land this plane, this is going to be one of my favorite horrors ever. It was fascinating. Um, I agree with kind of the point you're making. It is very much like, yeah, but bro, like I've thought about this. I've read a book and saw one documentary on it. Yeah, there is an element of that, but that's more like the script has that element, the performance and yeah. the engagement of it and the, the push and pull of it all. And the uh, characters having to make decisions of, do I agree just to go along with it or do I not? Like, how do I go? And just constant there. Um, there is substance to the debate and they, they let all sides air out where it's like essentially one character at one time makes the point that you made where it's like, yeah, you're just saying the same shit we hear all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, But the natural push pull just adds to the tension as it builds and builds and builds. Um, I loved also the use of iterations throughout all of this. And like, that was a point in the movie that they made, but, the movie does it itself in terms of like how it constantly replays the same things as well. I thought that was fascinating too. Um, it didn't fully land the plane and much like yourself, I thought again, they, they, they set up this amazing concept and then they just didn't know how to end it. Um, but I was satisfied with where they got while also understanding that I'm like, ah, there, there is a point where it goes from tense to spooky. And that's when you're like, okay, right. You know, yeah. you, you didn't get there, but I admire that you tried. Um, but you, Grant, gives one of the best performances I've ever seen in the horror, and it deserves the credit. I, I agree that I think as well. Um, I think when it hits streaming, I think it's something that horror fans should definitely check out, and I think it's going to find a really big cult following, and it deserves it. It's an excellent attempt. Um, again, doesn't fully work, um, but it never ruins the movie either. It, it, it gets away with it. Um, lastly, I think we need to discuss this weekend's big release. Let's talk about Conclave, which is uh, directed by All Quiet in the Western Front uh, directors Edward Burgett and written by Peter Strawn, based off a 2016 Robert Harris novel. Um, it's where Ray Fiennes uh, and kind of a murderous row of kind of actors as well essentially uh, play out the conclave process in the Vatican of electing a new Pope after the previous Pope, the movie begins with the previous Pope dying. Um, and it actually pairs really well. I saw this on election day and I'm like, I am in exactly the headspace for this. <laughs> That's essentially what it is. It's, it's, it's watching the election, the election, trying to find a new Pope and the machinations around it. Very, very simple. A lot of effort put into the Sistine Chapel, which is recreated in this, although there's artistic license used to make it more prison like. There's a lot of, a lot of work went into this behind the scenes. Like they really wanted to make this feel, um, legit legitimate and and, and kind of the, there's a lot of stuff where conclave traditions featured in the movie are true to life like there's destruction of the pope's ring the pa papal apartment being shut off cardinals being sequestered and uh, the sistine chapel's windows being like dark and shuttered and locked um also just to mention that benitez who ends up playing a big role in the movie carlos diaz uh, it's his first major film performance having previously been an architect until 2020 and then he just after his last 
last child left home, he took online acting classes. And there's a man who has made COVID work for him. <laughs> now he's staring across from Ray Fiennes. Um, that's Conclave. Uh, what were your thoughts, Tom? This is getting a lot of uh, Oscar buzz. And it, 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 it's looking for that, but does it deserve it? Yeah. Well, one question. What's black, white, and blue all over? <laughs> a depressed clergyman. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of those at the moment. Um, <laughs> all right, you got me there. <laughs> <laughs> it's all in the delivery, you know. I like um, the dark ones. I like the dark ones. <laughs> uh, so I um, it's interesting you mentioned election day. So this actually uh, this month was the Cork Film Festival. This opened the Cork Film Festival, and it opened the day after the U.S. election. Ah, nice. Uh, so See, it works there was, really well. There was there was no way of avoiding <laughs> and the, the kind of one in one comparison of this uh i think i've said this before i love a movie that can put me into a place where that feels well versed in a world that i was kind of unaware of or vaguely interested in so like the idea of being at the vatican during a conclave after the death of pope i just loved that it put me in that kind of environment i thought it was really it was clearly very well researched uh, and they enacted and re uh, reenacted things and that were like so excellently and it was just really a fascinating world to be in it's a great setting for a film um because you know it's the vatican um and there's so much visually there and it's such even though it's confined to one location essentially it doesn't ever really feel like it it could like a lesser film just could have been like a bottle episode but instead it feels very interesting and there's moments where you're like oh it's a very modern looking part of the vatican that's interesting and essentially you know, the reason uh, this is so um, kind of suited to the, the discussion of elections is not just the fact that they're trying to elect a new pope, but also it's mirroring a lot of what we're facing in current politics in general, which is kind of the the clash between traditionalist kind of, you know, conservative views and more neo-liberal uh, views and more modern views, we should say. Um, and that's kind of what is mirrored here what, is what's going on in the church and it's fascinating uh, I really enjoy this film mm. and it's a film that I thought could very easily have been kind of lightweight like when you kind of hear it's like yeah it's about a, a kind of a mystery element of of what's going on during an election in, in, in during the, the Vatican Popes and all these I was like okay I, I actually was kind of slightly relieved because when I first heard it I thought like I think I saw like a one word, like one line synopsis and it was like, oh, you know, the Pope is dead and all the the Popes are, all the Cardinals are hiding a secret. And I was like, oh, fuck, are you telling me one of these people killed the Pope? That is, that would be so low budget and crashy. It'd be <laughs> terrible. Um, but th thankfully, it's not that. Um, yeah. It's it's much, it takes the intellectual high road there. Um, it's based on a book by Robert Harris, um, which uh, I wasn't familiar with the book, but it definitely feels like a very kind of well-researched uh, and intricate book. I think it, it as much as it's going for Oscar re stuff, I I think it's it's sort of also like it it feels like this like in a in another era this would have been a very very dry film. I think it's a very interesting kind of tense thriller, um, and I think it's definitely bolstered by some excellent performances. Like Ray Fiennes is just giving such a a weirdly kind of staunch performance, like it feels like he's almost just playing himself at times mm -hmm. um, because he's very kind of like stone-faced, doesn't get a rise of him. But th th there's subtleties to his acting that are amazing. Like there's moments where like watching this in the screening, people were laughing at scenes where it, it was just his fade up face. <laughs> I don't know what other way to put it. Um, Stanley Tucci, uh, I thought did a great job as kind of a, the more kind of modern and liberal uh, part of the clergy uh, because there's a lot of questions about who he is and is are his reflection are are the views he's putting out actually reflections of who he is as a person mm. or is he in this for a selfish gain and that's kind of the question throughout the film are these people who are meant to be representing god and who are possibly going to be the pope are they actually these pious people deserving of that power and that are they acting in a way that would be fitting someone who would be in that position and there's a lot of people here watch that you watch and you're like they seem fine. And then as the film goes on, you're like, oh, I called that the wrong way. Um, there's like John Lithgow, for example, uh, who, again, 
you kind of look at him and you're like, that could be a, a good a, a good choice. But as we as we kind of learn a lot of things, and it comes a kind of a question of, and there's a, a quote in the film, I think that's something like, are we really going for who's the less bad option? And that's what I find really, really interesting. And again, it feels like it mirrored a lot of modern elections, especially the American election was in my head when I watched this, certainly. Um, we also have an actor who uh, I wasn't familiar with uh, called Sergio Castellito uh, as a kind of traditionalist Italian when he wants to take his church back to his roots, who I thought was excellent in this as well. He kind of steals yeah. every scene he's in. We also have mm-hmm. Isabel Rossellini in this movie, you know, um, which is like, well, we can't just overlook that. It's like she's she has very little to do in the movie, but when she does act in this movie, you're like, oh, that's that's the way you get Isabel, Isabel Rossellini for a role like this. I think it's a it's a film that is going to play well overall. I do think it it probably get a lot some Oscar attention. Is it best picture material? I'm not sure. Um, it it there's moments where it feels a little bit lightweight and a little bit obvious. Um, you know it, where it's like if you're playing up those whole, um, you know the two kind of different viewpoints within the church. You know it's very easy to just say okay, well let's put something that's going to escalate this, um, and then they all get to act and shout and blah. But I do think it works as a film. Uh, I think it, it it was much more entertaining than I thought it was going to be. Um, I'm not sure about the ending, um, but this, the ending kind of takes it to a point of, I don't want to say absurdity, um, mm. but it takes it to a point that's kind of, like for a movie that is at times so incredibly subtle, it feels like it just jumped up to 11 all of a sudden. Yeah. And I was like, that, and everyone everyone was la- burst out laughing when it happened. Yeah. But it worked. Uh, it worked. It's just a bit. It took me a bit. Be like, how do I don't know how I feel about that ending. Yeah, no, did it work? You know? Tom? Did it? I think you're being yeah, generous. I don't know. The word it's. Uh, <laughs> I, I. I. I'm still not sure. I wasn't sure at the time. I'm still kind of getting my head around it. Um, no, it if you it, found it, it did. That's fine. I, I'm interested. Now, but... No, I, I'm honestly not sure. That's actually someone asked me about it, and I was like, at the time we came over, and I was like, I'm not sure about the ending, yeah. because it really it 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 went from you know like it, it, this one barely had like a racing heart for a lot of it and all of a sudden it just goes boom and you're like whoa whoa whoa, whoa. <laughs> with no um, build up with no yeah. build there was nothing yeah. there was there's, nothing yeah. seated in there that that's said, true I, yeah yeah I, it's, a, it didn't it's an work odd for sort me. of a twist <laughs> yeah I, I again I feel like there's some there there's something there that they could have tweaked to make it work uh, it kind of plays into comedic absurdity at the end which. Does it suit the rest of the film at times? Um, it I feel felt like, was, like uh, without yeah. giving away any details, it's like it, it's similar to what we said about Heretics ending. It felt like they're like, oh Jesus, we have to make one of these the Pope, and we have to have a reason yeah. for it. And then they just cobble together something. They're like, what would be really dramatic yeah. and get people talking? And then it's like, okay. It, okay. There's a little bit. I don't know. It kind of almost felt like it was the other thing around me. It kind of felt like a little bit like reality TV. Yeah. <laughs> like 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 Pope Idol, you know, like all these popes oh, are like, <laughs> like it's just backstabbing each other bitches it's like like all of a sudden like they bring someone there and and one of the the cardinals is is is, 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 is like freaking freaking out and it's like oh he didn't know they were coming into the camp oh so you know <laughs> <laughs> so like that's what i mean when i say like it could have been really highbrow thing and it kind of feels at times like it's a little bit more lowbrow sensibility yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. kind of soapy trash in a fun way but no i enjoyed it um again i think the ending is the one thing that i'm still not sure about i, I mean it's literally nearly been like i'm like nearly a month since I've seen it now, and I'm still yeah. not sure how I feel about that ending. I don't know it's, if it's gonna. Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't. Wild. I'm not sure where it sits with me yet. It's still a bit of an odd one. It, it it's wild. The ending's wild. <laughs> I'm I'm like I. <laughs> like I, I, I could see I, no one is going I, to be able to predict the ending like even based yeah, on what the, the, there's no way you can whatever predict the ending, I okay? say here unless I tell you what it is you're not going to get it because it's like what <laughs> genuinely one of those votes but I kind of like I, I I enjoyed how random it was and how I'm like that's just not the movie I've been watching <laughs> um, I, I quite like this movie. I thought it was very well made. And and it's a subject that I'm really interested in. I remember being told about the conclave process when I was a child. And like, obviously the thing everyone gets told is about the smoke. And it's like, okay, but what happens in the room? And I'm like, oh yeah, I wanted to know that. Like, and um, it's really well made. It's really well told. The score, I want to give a shout out to. It adds attention and excitement to just kind of really boring everyday activities where you're like oh shit stuff's happening because the score's telling you um i also like the subtle storytelling which again the ending is as subtle as a brick but um the subtle storytelling for the other 90 percent of the movie like um 
where it kind of normalizes the cardinals and makes them just like normal ambitious people that kind of um repositions this as kind of a political thriller instead of a religious movie because again i like i i hope i'm not one of the preach athe atheists who spoke about but i am an atheist i i i don't care that much about the church i find this particular tradition fascinating but like yeah. um I, you know, I, I, I'm like, okay, if you're going to flatten this out into a political thriller, I can get into it. And then, and, and then you have the backdrop of the church and the weight of it. And this person's God's representative alive. But well, these men, none of these are godly people. Um, They're people who are smoking. They're just ambitious. They're uh, essentially looking like gamblers at Cheltenham, like for, for the most of it. Like it's, it's quite fun, but they're, they have these silly hats and outfits and so on. Um, I thought Ray Fiennes was great. Uh, I thought he carried this movie um, with a kind of gravitas, but also added to the kind of slow building stress of it all throughout as well. Like there was occasional just really intense outbursts where he's just like, oh, I'm get off. And he brings that energy to the role like at times. That, like, and again, the chef as well was one where he showed he has that quiet intensity that you can just go to 11 like that. And it was great. Also want to give a shout out. Really cool to see some Irish representation in Brian F. O'Byrne here. Um, just a small part, but I just, I, I enjoy him and I thought it was great to see him in, in a movie like this. Um, for me, uh, it's a really, really good movie for 95% of the way. <laughs> it's tough not I don't like criticizing movies for what I'd like it to be, but part of me was like, I feel like it took the subject matter a bit too seriously. Like I would have liked to see, it's not that I want the atheist part of me to win out. Like I can respect that it's a religious movie and you're, that's what the story you're trying to tell. But I would have liked to see what if this movie bought the favorite you know what I mean? Okay. Or like a it bit, had a bit too much reverence, like for us. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like, you know what I mean? Like at the same time, I'm like, hmm. you could also make this movie where it's silly little men with their silly little costumes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I'm not gonna criticize it for what I wanted it to be. I, on its own merits, I think it the 95% of it worked, and then they had to do an ending, and the ending is so fucking random. It did not work <laughs> at all. It is preposterous and what gets me about it is there was obvious pushback from the church and it's more conservative um outlets towards this movie and i don't care about like and again like they were trying to they were criticizing this for being woke and stuff like that and the usual shite that you hear these days and i'm like you just handed them that on a platter like you had a chance to say something and get in the mix and upset people. But sometimes if you upset the right people, you've done a good job. And the church at times can be the right people to upset. You know what I mean? So yeah, fucking upset them. But to do so in such a ridiculous way, I'm like, yeah, like you, you did, like you did, you went too woke for me and I'm a social fucking Democrat. You know what I mean? Like, I'm like that's fucking ridiculous. Like there's nothing, nothing at any stage which suggests that that's where it's headed. And yet now we just have to deal with it. But then you don't deal with it because it's the ending and we don't get to see the consequences or anything that comes of it. It's just like, oh, by the way, blah, 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 blah. What? And then the movie's over. And it's like, what? what? What just happened? Like, why did you do that? You know what I mean? Imagine like fucking at the end of it, you like you watch Jaws and you're like, that was a thrilling movie. And then someone at the end just goes, that wasn't a shark. That was a goldfish. See you later. What? 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 Why? <laughs> I'm like, what? I have to rethink the entire movie, but I still don't think that makes sense. But you just changed everything at the last second. Like, um, but no, really well movie. I, I think it will get nominated for Best Picture. And I, but I think it'll be one of those movies that we're annoyed it's nominated for Best Picture when we're like, mm. Doom Part 2 doesn't get nominated, but this does or something like that. Um, But yeah, I can't get... Look, it is worth seeing. It's a really well made movie. It's just I, I wish the ending was better. Um, Let's do some real quick hits uh, on the other movies we've seen this month. Paddington in Peru, uh, first Paddington movie to be produced by Sony as opposed to Heyday Films, where you have 
the original director, he's moving into production role and everyone else is kind of getting a promotion here. To be honest, it feels like that. It's big. It's, it's the typical kind of sequel that you didn't want Paddington to make. It's big, it's loud. It's screaming the nuance that made the first two movies work, but it does return most of the likable cast and there's enough of the original DNA involved to keep it fine and likable enough for the kids to enjoy but i thought it was uh, super forgettable paddington in peru tom your thoughts yeah i mean i i i probably prefer it to to you i i again a lot of people are saying it's the worst paddington film uh it probably is maybe maybe a little bit under the first one uh, it kind of does lose what a, a lot of the the magic of the first one it takes kind of paddington who is this kind of you know fish out of water and brings him in peru and I didn't think that necessarily worked. There are a lot of things I did like. <laughs> no like one wants this, to you know? see a fish in water movie. <laughs> yeah. Fishes belong yeah. in water. Like that's but like this norm. is the story of how the fish went back to the water. Like <laughs> and did what swam in the water. Oh great, okay. Um, <laughs> and yeah, like it. it there's moments I, I still thought it was really really good. I still really enjoyed it. I got a lot of laughs out of it. It does feel like they pretty much just tried to remake Paddington Two again uh, at times. And uh, yeah, I also thought that. Uh, <laughs> Like the it goes really weirdly deeply into Paddington lore, which I just really didn't need or want, really. Yeah, like, like I don't need to know the Paddington like origin story. It's like, no, it's it's fine. <laughs> He's, He's a bear, a bear from, in from London who <laughs> likes marmalade because London people like marmalade, and it's funny yeah, like, because yeah, yeah, he's a way of poking fun at the English. And yeah. their Less is more sometimes, you know. Yeah, that that that's what Paddington is. So he doesn't need to be in Peru. Um, yeah. Superman: The Christopher Reeve Story, the first documentary from DC Movies, really emotional, really interesting behind the scenes look at the story of Christopher Reeve. Um, I think it's a must for anyone with a disability. I don't have that much to say on it. It's just a really good documentary. I just enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm saying I, I really good documentary, really touching and heartwarming. Uh, a lot of great kind of insight behind the scenes stuff. But yeah, I mean, uh, a sad watch, sombering watch, but uh, definitely one worth watching. Again, don't have much to add. It's it's exactly what it says in the tin. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, juror number two is Clint Eastwood's possible last movie with Nicholas Holt as a juror who realizes early into the trial awkwardly he may be the person who committed the crime. Um, really interesting premise and kind of gets you thinking about how, what would you do, how it is. It's well acted by everyone, but also at the same time, it feels in the way it's made, and it's sad to say this about Eastwood's last movie, it feels like kind of a lifetime movie a, a, a bit of times for me. Um, it feels like the type of movie you've seen hundreds of times before in style, substance, and everything doesn't really offer much in terms of how it tells the story um but it's grand it's interesting it's an airplane movie nothing more um i enjoyed it but i'm never going to think about it again i also really enjoyed it uh but i do think it's uh like yeah like you said this was originally going to streaming it does feel like and look kind of like a streaming movie um and i think that's probably where it possibly belongs um i i liked it i enjoyed there's a lot of twists to it definitely stretches believability but i found it very entertaining I, this is a movie I thought I was like my parents are going to like this it kind of feels like one of those kind of movies you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and again Grant if you're looking for a movie to stream on a Saturday night that you want to think you're turning your brain on for but you don't really need to then this is probably that um, Small Things Like These is Killian Murphy's follow up to Oppenheimer about the Magdalene Laundries it's a really understated movie but it's for me the most effective telling of how the church really religious show I didn't realise that going in it's a really <laughs> effective telling how the church suffocated Ireland into silence and complicity probably the best version of that I've seen on the screen in most months we'd have given this half an hour it'd be an easy movie in a month it's really fucking good but uh, we had to cut something so small things yeah. like these got cut but it is excellent go see a Killian Murphy absolutely knocking out of the park as always yeah so I would say the same as well uh, very again I would talk about a movie with a very like slow heartbeat I don't even know if this one has a heartbeat it's so kind of like slow and deliberate and plodding uh, in a really good way. And I feel like it's going to hit people in Ireland more than it hit anyone else, obviously, because it is a very Irish story. Clay Murphy is excellent in this, just showing how why, what a great actor he is with basically taking such a small and subtle role that has not, not a lot to it and making a meal of it. Uh, I thought it was excellent. Yeah, I think definitely check it out. It seems like it's doing massive business here in Ireland. Anyway, it's been, I, I mean, see like three or four weeks into its run, I'd say. And it was yeah. just packed out, you know. Yeah, yeah, and it deserves it. But I, I, and I just didn't expect it when I saw it because I'm like, people aren't going to get this, but they are, and it's brilliant. And uh, it's also sad because I think they get it because it resonates with us. But also on the positive side, Killian Murphy's obviously now a huge star in the draw after Oppenheimer, which is just great to see. Uh, another movie uh, featuring an Irish actor that uh, could have got movie of the month is Bird. I know you haven't seen this yet, Tom. I recommend no. you do. It's the movie Barry Keoghan turned down Gladiator two for written and directed by Andrea Arnold. 
Arnold. Um, really, really pushed hard for a movie of the month. Uh, it's a story of neglected Bailey, played by uh, Inkia Adams, who meets a possibly imaginary friend, uh, who's played by Franz Rogowski, uh, who you may know from Passages, playing a completely different type of character. Uh, a really affecting movie, really hilarious at times like there's some funny jokes in it at one stage barry kogan's character turns around and someone sa- says play murder on the dance floor and he's like that's shy <laughs> so I, I like the kind of meta references uh everyone in the movie bought in on it but like it it's it's also there there's a, another twist in this as well where you're like oh that's a little bit far and a little bit on the mm. nose and i don't know how it goes very daring and high concept though which i like and again it doesn't fully land but similar to heretic it, it builds enough goodwill that uh if you want a bit of domestic weirdness it's well worth checking out like i said it pushed hard but then the more i thought about it the less it stuck with me, you know what I mean? So I, I'm comfortable with, uh, you know. Uh, but it, again, a lot of months it would have been my uh, movie of the month. Uh, last one, I know you haven't seen this as well. Don't, it's Blitz. I said last week or last month it was the movie I was looking for, for it to most. I was wrong. It was a massive yeah. letdown that seems to essentially be EastEnders set during the war. Uh, the, and the worst part about it is there's a couple of good scenes in this that show what the movie could have been. But then it goes right back to being hammy and camp for a really serious subject matter that it's getting on. Like, essentially, at times they want you to care and cry like it's War Horse. But then you're going to the Queen Vic and you're like, oh, it's War Horse. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just so, like, yeah, eye rolling. Not good. Blitz, avoid it. It's on no. Apple TV. Don't bother. Uh, and else you've seen, Tom, that you want to mention? Yeah, I mean, I saw, like, a crazy amount of movies. I think I saw like 19 movies this month. Um, so uh, again, I went to the Cork Film Festival. Uh, I mentioned this all conclave. I also saw We Live in Time, The Damned, The End, Night Bitch, The Brutalist, and Rumors. Oh, so, yeah, I saw a lot. Uh, some of these you can't see yet. Um, so I'm not going to say much about them. I will say one of the films I named though would absolutely make my top 10. Ooh, so that's okay. all I want to say. That's a little thing. Uh, I also saw uh, Red One. Yes. And I think that's our show, is it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. No said. Awful, awful stuff. Um, Tom, we're not going to do a, a proper show next month. We're going to do our top 10 of the year. So we're not, unless one of the movies that we're, we're seeing makes it by then. Um, but in terms of December, is there anything you're really looking forward to? Um, I don't think it's coming out December here. I think it might be New Year's Day here. I'm really looking forward to Nosferatu. Um, yes, yes, yes. Aside from that, I haven't really looked at them. I know like the the Mufasa thing is coming out. Um, that has oh. me weirdly interested in it. I okay. don't think it's going to be good. Uh, I Lion King is the one I grew up with. That's like the first film I saw in cinema. So I always have a weird attachment to the Lion King, even though the last one pretty much broke my heart in real time. I think I was crying, and not because Simba's dad was dead. I was crying because I was watching the fucking movie. Um, <laughs> but I don't know. I, I, the only thing I'm interested in, I'm like, this is different. It's like a new story, but other than that, nah, I don't, there's not much. I mean, Sonic, I've, I've kind of enjoyed the other Sonic movies more than expected to. So, yeah, I don't know. There's not nothing jumping out at me right now. I'm probably going to forget, forget something really obvious. You'll probably name it and I'll be like, yes, that one actually. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, I am. Um, yeah, there's nothing. It, it, like, Nosferatu is is the big one. Um, for me, it's got to be Lord of the Rings, Warder, or for the Rohirrim. Um, it's just giving me an excuse to binge the trilogy, which I'm going to do uh, next weekend if I get the chance. So, um, and yeah, amazing. I'm big up for the, like, kind of the animated Lord of the Rings series. So, yeah, excellent. I can't wait. Um, um, Tom, we're going to be back later this week um, for you guys. We're going to record it now for us. Um, we're going to be back probably Friday uh, where we watched Netflix's new Lindsay Lohan rom-com, Our Little Secret. Um, so you guys don't have to. We're going to be going in and recapping it. We'll give you everything you need to know so you can just avoid it. It's the number one film on Netflix, though, uh, in Ireland today, which is... I don't know, that's worrying. It has me worried for my country. More worried than re-elected Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael, to be honest. But anyway, uh, <laughs> Tom, you've got a lot going on, though, over in the Pop Club pod. Yeah, um, I, I always speak a big game when I'm promoting stuff on here. Uh, last, maybe the last two months, last while I said that I'm putting out a video every day in December. I need to address that. You have um, two videos out now, Tom. It's the 2nd of December when we record this. I have two videos out and I... 
I'm not going to have a video out every day. I'm going to have, <laughs> I'm going to have multiple videos Fuck out off. every day. I think if I get my count right and I get everything right, I'm going to have 52 videos out this month. Holy shit. Yeah. Now, you know, some if of you these... just did one a week for a year, you could just. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm making up for last time. Um, now, I, I would say a lot. Some of this is repurposed content, but for good reason. So, okay. A couple of years ago, I did uh, the Ultimate Christmas Film Tournament. I went, took a, a field of 100 films and narrowed it down to 32 and then did a World Cup tournament. That I determined myself. A lot of people have done that. I want to try to get to the bottom of what everyone thinks. So I'm putting up every single bracket that happens as an individual video and getting people to vote. So I'm going to actually ask for your votes in a sec. But it's not all old content. Last year, I did 12 Days of Christmas and I did um, different Christmas sitcom episodes, 12 of my favorites. This time I'm doing... 12 uh, animated special episodes. So like, you know, uh, Family Guy, Simpsons, South Park, those kind of things. Um, that starts from December 13th. As we get after Christmas, we're going to have some super cuts of other content. Then I'm going to talk about uh, highlights of the year, lowlights of the year, surprises, disappointments, best, my top 10 of the year, which will be different to this one because I'm on a weird schedule because of some films I saw last year that didn't come out. So it will be different. I promise you that. Um, and also things I'm looking forward to in 2025. So yeah, there is there's a lot going on in Pop Cold Podland at the moment. Um, and yeah, I want people to vote in the Ultimate Christmas Film Tournament. So you can do that okay. on my socials. You can do it on TikTok, uh, Pop Cold Pod everywhere, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Um, you can comment under the videos. Even if you don't watch the videos, I'd love to hear what people say because I am going to do a video saying what the people's vote would have been. And if I did the tournament now, is there any more modern Christmas films in the last few years that would have got in? So to give you an example of the randomness of the brackets, I'm going to get you to vote on four of these brackets now. Now, again, okay. four sounds like a lot. There is, I think, 16 brackets in the first round. So okay. I'm just going to give you four of them, right? I'm going to pick you four random ones. Okay, here we go. The Santa Claus with Tim Allen or Jim Carrey's Dr. Zeus's How the Grinch Stole Christmas? Mm, Santa Claus. Okay, interesting. Now, I should say, some of these ones are even more random and some of them are just squashes, but I'm giving you some interesting ones. The okay. Muppet Christmas Carol or Gremlins? Uh, Muppet Christmas Carol, not close. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go with Scrooge or A Christmas Story? Scrooge, Bill Murray, all okay. day. <laughs> and last one I'm going to ask you is Love Actually or Jingle All The Way? Literally, as soon as you said Love Actually... I'm go. I, I said I'm voting for whatever the other thing is, and then you <laughs> named one of my favorite Christmas movies. It's Shingle all the way. Easy. Okay. Easy. There we go. Okay. Well, so far you voted the same way I voted, but I know the that there's a way. lot of yeah, the correct way I'd like to think. Yeah. But some people might say they prefer Gremlins. Some of these are weird. Gremlins, are, Gremlins I, is the interesting one. Now I'm just yeah. not as big on Gremlins as everyone else, but it is yeah. the interesting one of those four. Yeah. So the, like again, these are all totally randomly drawn. There is some heartbreaking ones up ahead. Uh, so at okay. one point, I had to choose between uh, the Muppet Christmas Carol and Die Hard. Um, I had to choose between uh, Christmas Vacation and Scrooge, which again, two kind of loved Christmas mm. Christmas comedy classics. There, uh, there's other really tough matchups ahead that we're going to get um in some cases we're going to get four videos a day out um mm, okay some days it's going to be two uh, and then it's going to be new content new content new content so yeah please check out the pop up i'm literally giving you my all if this is enough i fucking quit i'm done okay <laughs> um so yeah there we go Pop Cold Pod, YouTube, you everywhere. Needed. Link is in uh, links in the show notes, guys. Give Tom a follow and, and Bo on those as well. Uh, really interesting stuff. I love when a work up gets really like spicy and like towards the end and you get the really big ones. Yeah. Die Hard against Home Alone would be difficult because it's like they're the same movie. I was hoping um, they were going to get there. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, Tom, we'll be back later in the week talking about Lindsay Lohan movie because why do we do this to ourselves? Uh, in the meantime, next time on page 180, after that, uh, we'll have Kento on. Uh, for a sports catch up including a world championship darts preview plus in December we're going to look at the top 10 movies as we said and TV shows of the year so stay tuned to the feed it's going to be busy here as well until then for Tom Pot of the Pop Cup Pod follow him if you haven't already thank you very much I've been Jared Leggett this has been page 180 and it seems the artichoke is steamed